Well, the official records say that Jabe Nicholson is 73 years old today. Born January 3rd, 1951. Or as old people usually say, 19 and 51. Halfway through last century. Um... It so happened that I made my mother go into the hospital on Christmas Day, and she spent the whole day there, but I didn't come. I didn't come until January 3rd, and that meant my father, who was a Scotsman, missed a whole year of tax deduction. He eventually found it in his heart to forgive me. But you know, in reality, January 3rd isn't my real birthday. It's true. I'm a billionaire. I've traveled six billion 786 million miles around the sun. Unfortunately, I have no uh, frequent flyer miles to go with that. But (sighs) my birthday is actually the day that the Lord Jesus saved me. I was stillborn. I was born dead in my sins. And, uh, And yet as a little boy, I came to the realization of what it meant to be lost. We were in a large group of people. I don't know what it was, some kind of fair or market. And uh, I had let go of my father's hand. I was looking at something. I became fascinated by it. I was a curious little guy. And uh, my family kept moving along. And eventually I got tired of the thing I was looking at. I looked over and I saw a pair of trousers that looked just like my father's trousers. Shoes looked like his shoes. And I began to follow these trousers through the crowd. And at some point or other, I looked up. (laughs) And I was horrified to discover that the head didn't match the body. I'd been following someone else's legs. And it shocked me. And I realized at that moment, what does it mean to be lost? And the Spirit of God used that in my little heart. I was just a little fellow, but It became so real to me. And a few days later, my father found me down the back stairs. We lived in a little one-bedroom cottage at a place called Moot Street, a wartime housing that my parents had been able to afford after the Second World War. And uh, the back stairs went down to the basement. There was a full basement in that little place. And I was sitting on the back stairs, and I was weeping. My father heard me weeping. And he came around, came through the side door, and he was standing on the landing, just about at my eye level. And he said to me, son, what is the problem? And I was weeping so hard I couldn't speak, but all I did was went like this, pointed downward. And he obviously, led by the Spirit, knew what that meant. (laughs) He didn't think I was concerned because I'd fallen down the stairs or I was afraid of the dark downstairs or whatever. Immediately, he said to me, Son, are you afraid of going to hell? Now, you know, there are some people who say we shouldn't be frightening our children into the gospel, into salvation. Well, I'm not saying we should use those tactics either. This was the Spirit of God speaking to my heart. My parents hadn't been telling me this. They had explained, of course, there was a real place called hell. But they hadn't been using as a tactic to scare me into the gospel. But I was scared. And you know, it's right to be scared of hell. It's a scary place. When my father was preaching to adults, he sometimes would say, Mr. Preacher, are you trying to scare me? And he would say, well, I'd rather scare you into heaven than let you sleep your way to hell. Well, I was well scared And I wanted to know the answer. And my father had always carried a little testament with him. Um, It took on the shape of his uh, back pocket spot. (laughs) And he, he opened it up and he read to me just one verse. John 3, verse 36. And he explained to me that the Lord Jesus, in one hand, He had a gavel, and he explained, you know, when you see a judge and he has that little wooden hammer in his hand, that's called a gavel. And the judge decides if a person is guilty. And Jesus knows that we're guilty sinners. 
But in his other hand, he has a gift. And we have to make a decision. Do we want the gift or the gavel? Do we want him to be our savior now or our judge later? And that's how we explain this verse. He who believes in the Son has everlasting life. That's the gift. And he who does not believe the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Now this was a shocking idea to me. I had heard about judgment to come, but this verse said that the wrath of God was hanging over my head. It was only the slender thread of God's grace that was holding back his judgment. As a little fellow, I knew what I wanted. I wanted everlasting life. It was my great aunt's birthday, November 8. And I'll never forget telling her and the joy that flooded her face as she discovered that I had put my trust in Christ on that day. And you know, as I often think of that, it was just a little childhood prayer. There wasn't much to it, really, as far as the world was concerned, but it changed my whole life. Now, I grew up in a home where I had absolutely every encouragement. My father had one of the best theological libraries anywhere. Uh, My parents prayed for me before I was born. My grandparents, my great-grandmother prayed for me before I was born. And so I had every reason to go on well for God. Did I face struggles? Yes. Did I waste time? Yes. But God preserved me. And there were many godly Christians who had impact and influence in my life. But when I went off to university, in those philosophy courses, sociology courses, psychology courses, because I stood up for the Lord, I became the target of many of these professors. And they would go after me. I was no match for them. And they would tie me up. They would embarrass me. They would, they would prove my arguments false. And I would have to stagger back out to my room, get down before God, open the Bible, search it out, find the answers, so that next time when I went back, I had something to say for the Lord. These were hard years for me, but they were good years for me. Because no longer did I say, well, my parents say, or, or I hear this preached, But I knew it to be true because I'd put it to the test and found the answers in the Word of God. And by God's grace, he's been able to use me over the years to encourage some folks, to answer some questions, to share what the Lord showed me on my knees in my college dorm. And so I I think all of us, at a time like this, as we look into the new year, we ought to be so grateful that we step into this year. We see what's going on in the world. We see the tectonic plates shifting underneath. Fundamental issues collapsing before our eyes. People don't know what a woman is. They don't know what marriage is. They don't know what gender is. And yet through all of this, God's people can stand and shine for the Lord Jesus. And so I encourage you, as we look into this new year, we don't know what the new year holds, but we know who holds us, and we are secure. He's put our feet on a rock and established our goings, and he's put a new song in our mouths. Let's be not only secure people, but happy people, speaking well of our God and of salvation, because he has put joy in our hearts and a song in our mouth and a spring to our step as we make our way home to glory.